Good morning and welcome to the Core Connection. I'm Mira Rubin here with you on Enlightened World Network. And today's topic is holding polarity, the good and the evil, the light and the dark, um, the positive and negative in order to transcend to another dimension of possibility, the third way, so to speak. Um, should be an interesting conversation. I look forward to it with you. But before we get started, let's take a minute or two to get present. Let's take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it. And imagine clean, crisp oxygen flooding your lungs, flowing into your bloodstream, nourishing all your cells and your organs and bringing vital life energy to your body and being. And as you exhale, exhale any tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's take another deep breath in through your nose and hold it. This time, imagine brilliant, bright light lighting you up from the inside out, illuminating, electrifying, and energizing all your cells, your molecules, your electrons, creating this brilliant beam of light from your heart out into the world. And as you exhale, exhale any remaining tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's press our palms together rub them vigorously together to create friction and energy and buzzing and feeling all those sensations and allow those sensations to bring you present right here, right now into this remarkable physical form that enables you to experience all of life. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, Rosalind. Welcome to everyone else who's joining us. It's great to have you here with us this morning. And um, we're going to talk about holding polarity and also about how living systems change and, and what it is that, that um, creates that impetus. And so... Um, another mass shooting yesterday on uh, July 4th. And although I didn't see it reported in the news, um, my mother uh, texted me, letting me know that there had been two police officers shot at the Independence Day um, fireworks in Philadelphia yesterday. And so, you know, it, it it looks like between, you know, just overall, it looks like there's an increase in violence or I, I don't know if there's an increase in violence or there's an increase of the reporting of violence. I don't know. Um, but uh, it, there are many things that we can look at in the world and see things kind of going to hell in a handbasket in multiple ways and um, it's easy to get consumed by the negativity that, that we can easily find and um, that is being fed to us as a regular diet in um, standard media. Um, and at the same time, there are all kinds of remarkable, positive things that are happening that we don't hear as much about, but they're there if we choose to look for them. Um, and um, these, these are polarities. You know, we see tremendous progress and tremendous regression. We see tremendous expansion and tremendous contraction. We see tremendous good and tremendous ill. And um, what we get to do is to learn to hold all of this uh, as part of what is. And in that holding, in allowing ourselves to be present to that polarity and to all of those kinds of events, there's, there is an unarticulated 
beingness that opens the way for unnamed possibilities. Um, and it's kind of in, in choosing no side in a way we choose all sides. Like we choose to go beyond that and or the unification of it, the next quantum level of these um, moving from polarity to wholeness. <clears throat> and uh, I said I was going to talk about living systems change that um, I, I've mentioned I, recently, but um, the way that living systems transform is through pressure being applied to the system. And when there's enough pressure, it pops to another a, a dimen an evolutionary new dimension. And um, we're certainly having a lot of pressure applied, right? We're certainly experiencing pressure on all kinds of levels. And at some point, things are gonna have to give. I guess the question is how much pressure do we endure before that, that transformation happens? Um, we've, we've talked about wise hope yesterday and um, wise hope is not ignoring what is it's metabolizing what is to again it's kind of holding the polarities metabolizing what is to be able to move into this other dimension of perception that is not polarized that recognizes the unity of all of it it's the difference between looking at heads or tails on a coin and looking at the coin itself and recognizing that heads and tails are part of the unity of that entire coin. And from that space of unity, there's, there's the dynamism, the movement of the polarities. So if we think about the yin yang sign, we see it flat typically, but I have this very cool sculpture. It's a, it's like a slinky kind of thing that is a yin yang in three dimensions. And when this thing spins, you can see the transformation of the, the, the one, you know, the one into the other. And there's this dynamic movement and it's the movement, that dynamic movement that creates the universe, that creates the, um, the dynamism of the universe. So the transformation of the one into the other, the light into the dark, the dark into the light, these are movements that, that are part of a greater whole. And um, I have a sense that there are points in that movement that are points of almost like acupuncture points for change and transformation you know that that there's this dynamic as these movements are taking place but there's a place in in a moment in time when they're in equilibrium and then there's another moment in time when they're in their extreme opposites and or in their most extreme expressions and um I, I'm sensing that those points are the points of transformation. Those, good morning, good morning, Deepak. Welcome, so good to have you here with us. I don't know if I've seen you here before. So um, we're talking about holding polarity, um, what holding the seeming opposites, holding the good and the ills of the world all at once, holding, holding, unity and from that place of this holistic perspective the awareness is different it's very different from if i'm looking at the darkness or i'm looking at the light when i'm looking at the whole 
um, there's, it's a whole different perception. And when we recognize the dynamic of these dualities playing out to create this, this um, dynamic universe, then, then our perspective can't help but shift and new previously unimagined possibilities then emerge. And um, when we, you know, it's interesting when we talk about thinking outside the box, I, it just, I had this image, you know, is actually standing outside the box, seeing the whole box instead of just seeing the inside of the box from being in it. And um, so Rosalind says, what do you say when someone's point of view is different? Agree to disagree. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's sometimes where that kind of conversation stops is to agree to disagree. Uh, because there's not, it takes courage. It takes courage to have that conversation with someone who has a very different vantage point. It takes courage to, on both sides, uh, for people to have open-hearted listening and communication to move through the, the challenges and the reactivity that we might be experiencing and unfortunately in my recollection of those kinds of conversations recently that's the best solution that we've been able to arrive at and there are worse ones which are you know well I'm not talking to you anymore kind of thing and I've encountered that too unfortunately um I was hearing something on NPR the other day about uh, from from psychologists and psychiatrists, and uh, there was the conversation was about political vantage point and how our politics have become as um, polarizing as religion used to be where um, you know, we have differences of belief, so we excommunicate each other based on those differences, politically or ideologically. And um, the reason, I think one of the, the, one of the foundational reasons for that is that we associate our identities somehow with our beliefs, like we believe that we are our beliefs and we kind of act as if they're immutable when they're not. Um, and we, at, in that identification, if someone challenges our beliefs, it's challenging our sense of self, our sense of identity, our sense of um, knowing of ourselves and so rather than trying to reach a place of understanding, because that's threatening, right? It's threatening if I, if you and I have opposing viewpoints on something and, and we each commit to listening to each other with open heart, to we commit to a, an intention of understanding, then that may erode my the conviction or the courage that I have of my conviction it, um, or the the fixedness I have about my conviction and if my conviction goes away then maybe if I'm identified with that then who I don't know who I am anymore and that is a very very threatening thing to many many people because we think that our identity is fixed or that our identity truly can be threatened. Like when we're, when we're really present, the beliefs are, are just overlays. It's not the essence of who we are. And so 
to find the courage and generosity both to be able to truly deeply entertain in a heartfelt way another person's perspective you know to have two people that have the courage and the commitment to understanding um, that's transformational it's also unfortunately extremely rare in my experience so far hopefully that will change over time that we will become more willing to really listen and and have the courage to step outside of dogma to go to discourse you know to move into conversation and um connection and understanding like really trying to understand somebody else's point of view and and to also find bridges to our commonality you know like um i think i think in many respects we adopt vantage points without necessarily with that not always with the deepest thought behind those vantage points. You know, we, we consume um, talking points and we absorb them in many cases and, and become programmed by them and rather than being able to hold the polarity, you know, rather than being able to expand our, our sense of self enough to encompass all of it, you know, to encompass the possibility of, of understanding both sides of, of and, and the other thing that's threatening about that actually is not having a decisive pathway right if i if your your idea and my idea are opposed then and i can then understand really deeply understand where you're coming from and you can deeply understand where i'm coming from then what right like um the the conflict there there may be such a thing as irreconcilable differences you know and it may be that it comes down to what you're saying roslyn um that we agree to disagree it may be that that's where we we end up um and there may be there may be a place from that place of connection that allows us to go to a higher level from which we can be in alignment with one another. Um, and it may expose possibilities and solutions that would otherwise be unimaginable, where we can partner with each other rather than be opposing one another. <clears throat> you know, so what does it what does it look like when we hold polarity? What what it, kinds of possibilities are we talking about? What might be truly available to us? So the thing um, there's an Einstein quote which I'm going to mutilate here which is that a problem can't be solved from the level of consciousness in which it emerged. What does that mean? It means we get to, <clears throat> we get to jump to another level of awareness. And there is a place where as we keep jumping up, there is a place where your values and my values coincide, whoever you and I are. There is a place where we're holding something in common, at least 
in most in most situations that I can imagine, other than than a pathological one, I can imagine that there is a place where we can find connection, where we can find alignment. Ralston says, if there are 40 or more world problems, and it comes down to how our resources being used, the best path forward can look like what is moving it, what it can look like, what is the more loving choice? Relationship rather than victim. So, wow, I just want to pick that apart, Rosalind, because I don't know where the number 40 came about as far as 40 world problems. Um, but that's, you know, that in and of itself would be a whole conversation to be looking at what do we define as problems? What's a problem? And, um, and then you say it comes down to how our resources being used. That's another one. I just have to say, well, what are resources? And um, I don't think it comes down to how our resources being used. I don't think any problem comes down to how resources are being used. I think the, the problem comes down to how we think about who we are on the planet as human beings, who we are in relation to nature and ourselves and each other. You know, I think that that's what all the problems come down to. Anything that we might call a problem is coming down to the way that we think and be. I mean, that's, that's really where the change needs to take place because we can be acting on all these systems that we have. Um, the thing is that from the mode of thinking that we currently have, we're not identifying the source of the, of the, pro of the quote unquote problem. You know, what we're, what we're calling a problem is most often a symptom and it's not recognizing whatever the perceived issue is or the, the symptom I'm gonna call it is in the greater context. It's usually something that is identified through a reductionist view and, and not looking at um, causative factors you know it's just looking at symptoms it's like well i have a cold so i'm gonna take this that or the other thing rather than looking at well what's going on you know my immune system is depleted because i'm eating the way i'm eating i'm sleeping the way i'm sleeping and yes i can put a band-aid on the symptom and uh what about the real issue that you know what is it that actually generated the condition that created the symptom that i'm now treating so you know we we tend to be living in a world that we have reduced to um a machine or reduced our understanding of the world to machinery and parts of a machine rather than as a living system. And we are so deeply indoctrinated to that, that we're wanting to, we're wanting to solve problems. We're wanting to fix things. And the things that we look at fixing are, um, connected to bigger things that that thing is part of. And um, our, it's, it is this mechanistic reductionist view that has gotten us into the fix that we're in. Like we go and we solve a problem and in the solving of the problem, we generate a whole bunch of other new problems. You know, so for example, we can look at fossil fuel, we recognize that there's a big problem with fossil fuel, right? 
So we're going to fix it with electric. And we're going to have solar panels and we're going to have batteries. But the thing is that solar panels and batteries are relying on resources that are limited too. And we're still dealing with an extractive mentality. So we fix one problem and we've created another because we just have different kinds of waste and different kinds of abuse, right? But it's the same mindset that caused us to come up with those kinds of solutions and that are driven by economy, you know, but driven by money and how can we make money and how can we create a new market and how can we create profit and, and, and not looking at the whole cycle of all of it in the context of living and living systems. And so part of this holding the polarity is being able to jump up to that whole system thinking to be able to see the whole coin rather than just heads or tails. And um, so I think if we, if we take a look, I really appreciate what you wrote here, Rosalyn, because it exposes even, even as progressive as we like to think we think, um, we are very deeply encoded or en enmeshed in this mechanistic perspective. And um, we get to keep looking at ourselves, keep looking at how we're thinking, keep looking at the, the boundaries of our thought and what's what's enforcing those boundaries in order to find a way to, to actually get outside the box. Um, Cause even what happens is that even as we get outside the box, we're taking the box with us in so many ways. And it's a, it's a deep and profound re-education that we're called to in order to find ways that are not just band-aids. I mean, the band-aids are great to get from here, here to here, but we ultimately have to get here. And so the, the um, band-aids are like, well, when you have a broken bone, it's important to go get that bone healed, right? So those are emergency, but temporary kinds of fixes. You know, they're not, they're not long-term solutions necessarily. So anyway, holding polarity, take a look at, at the polarities that we generate all the time and see what might be available to you if you were to unify those in your heart and mind. And, and um, it does take courage because it means stepping out of the duality that is our familiar home. So. Anyway, that's it for this morning. I'm Mira Rubin. This is The Core Connection. And I go live here each weekday morning on the Enlightened World Network Facebook page at 9 a.m. Eastern. I invite you to check out the other awesome programming at Enlightened World Network's Facebook page, as well as Enlightened World Living, EWN One with the Earth. And um, until next time. So, so, so much love to you and so much appreciation for your engagement and uh, your sharing here. And I encourage you, if you're enjoying this, please share it with other people so we can enrich our, our community and enrich each other ever more deeply. Until next time, so much love to you.